I find it interesting that as we study our scriptures, we see words in the Bible. And all words seem to have some kind of a picture. And we all seem to get different pictures from those words. For instance, when I say the word rose, what does a person see? A flower. What color? Red. What about some people see yellow? Some see white. Some people who are flower, whatever you call them, uh, and they love flowers, they might see a brown, flower, a brown rose, which somebody had worked years to make, or a black rose, a velvet black rose. They're incredibly beautiful. And all these words have similar meanings. Some people, when I say rose, think of love. That's what they think of. They think of love. When I say yellow rose, sometimes I think of Sayonari or Texas. See, we all have different ways we see these words. And I find it interesting that as people have translated our scriptures, a lot of the words get translated in a certain way because of their preconceived ideas. Not that they're wrong by any means. But we have to be aware that that does happen. You can take any five translations four translations or two, and go through verses, and you'll find different ways they're translated. And sometimes they have very different meanings. But you know, we, as the children of the Most High God, we are in training. Our training mostly is to become able to understand the mind of God, the heart of God, the will of God. And I have noticed that in my life, as in yours, most of those changes are quite subtle and slow. God doesn't generally do big changes at any one time. He kind of keeps working at us. You know, Rick back there has a soundboard. And that soundboard has, I don't know what, 25, 30 buttons on it. And he can change all the channels. If he wanted to, he could make my voice be very high. He could make my voice be very low. But what he does is he gets it to where it's perfect for whatever it is we're speaking about. Well, and you can see him back there moving these things up and down. And it likened me to one time when I was watching a television show, and this television show was about robots. And, you know, when a human being goes to the doctor, the doctor pulls out certain kinds of tools, needles, threads, pills, stethoscope and all those kind of things. But when the man who works the doctor for the robot comes in, he pulls out screwdrivers, pliers, different electronic gadgets and whatnot. And then what they do, it's like in Star Trek, any of you who are Star Trek fans, you know Data, he's a robot, and he would go in and he'd pop his head open. And he'd get all these pretty lights in there, and he'd start playing with it. Well, God is kind of like that with us. This is just an analogy. He's constantly flipping our head open and moving those dials. Of course, he never moves them down. He only moves them up. And the bottom is humanity without God. You know how we are. We have evilness. We have wickedness. We have all kinds of things that we shouldn't do. We have sin. You know, our hearts are weak and our minds are stubborn. But as, after we come to Jesus... Slowly but surely, he works those dials up. And the goal is that one day, they'll be all across the top like his mind. We will think like God. We will react like God. We will talk like God. We will do all the things we do as God does them. And I found that when I was, um, the other day, I was thinking about words, and the word evil came up. It came up through a discussion of, and I'm not going to answer this question, but the question was, are human beings born evil? One of our ladies' groups had a big discussion about that. And I got to thinking about that word evil. I had never really paid too much attention. I always thought, well, evil, sin is evil, period. But then I got to think about what they were saying and listening to the scriptures they were pulling. And then it struck me that in scripture... When you hear the word evil, 
it generally means something bad. Okay, that's kind of straightforward, something not so good. But then again, there's this word wicked. So what's the difference between wicked and evil? And then there's this word sin. Is there a difference between wickedness, wicked, sin, and evil? And it turns out, in my studies, I realize that there is. There is a difference. The word wicked in Hebrew, no, the word evil in Hebrew means to be unjust, injurious, or to defraud. That's what that word means, the word evil. And when we see evil used in Scripture, a lot of times God so-and-so did evil. So-and-so did this thing, and it was evil. Evil is a result. Now, wickedness, on the other hand, is when you look at wickedness in Scripture, and all the words are similar, it's a attitude. A wicked man is somebody who does bad stuff because he wants to. See, there's a reason behind that. Now, I find it interesting that the word evil is used 600 times in Scripture. In Old Testament, there's six different words that are translated evil. In the New Testament, there are eight different words that are translated evil. And each one has a little bit different meaning. Now, I'm not going to sit here and go through all the two to 3,000 scriptures that deal with what I'm talking about today. We'd be here until next Tuesday. But what I'm going to do is we're just going to talk about how these words interact with each other. Some of the meanings of evil are having bad qualities of a natural kind. Somebody who's mischievous. Having qualities that tend to injure or to produce mischief. For instance, in Genesis 37, the Bible says, some evil beast has devoured him. See, so evil can be used for sin type things, or it can also be used for other things that are bad. Like bad weather can be called evil. A hurricane does a lot of bad stuff, a hurricane does. Or an earthquake, or a volcano. Any natural disaster causes problems for people, and that's called evil in Scripture. So the, we got to understand that's one of the many uh, uses of the word evil. Uh, then evil can be natural or moral. Natural evil is anything which produces pain, disaster. That's not me. Loss of calamity, or which in any way disturbs the peace, impairs the happiness, or destroys the perfection of natural beings. So it's kind of something that just naturally happens. Or it could be something that a person does, or an animal does, that messes up the peace. Now, this is just for us to understand, when we read evil in Scripture, it's important that we pay attention to what evil is being talked about. We don't want to say that an animal that goes out and kills your chicken is evil in the sense of sin. They're not. They're just being that animal. That's what they do. But it's evil because it's a bad thing. We've lost a chicken. We've lost wealth. So the Bible calls that evil. Um, having bad qualities of the moral kind. Wicked, corrupt, perverse wrong as evil thoughts, evil deeds, evil speaking, an evil generation. Now these are talking about the bad things that people do to each other. So-and-so steals somebody's chicken. Those of you who are here, we talked about Jezebel. And how one of the evil things she did was kill a man for his vineyard. That's an evil thing.
So as we go through scripture, that word wicked can mean a lot of different things. And we as Christians can mess ourselves up if we're not careful. And we believe that God is saying one thing when really he's not. Now, how do we know what uh, words are being used? Well, thankfully, we have scholars that have been studying this stuff for hundreds and thousands of years. And we have this thing called a concordance. And you can go into this concordance, and it'll list all the times that the Bible uses the word evil. And then at the end, it'll give you the word that that comes from. And then you can go to the dictionary part, and it'll tell you what that word meant at the time that it was put in there. And it's interesting that the same words are used all the time. I've mentioned this before, and they all have understandings. So if you can go to that scripture and says such and such is evil, you can determine which evil it's talking about. That's very important for us to understand. Otherwise, we get all kinds of weird beliefs. You know, there's, in all the churches in our world, we all have beliefs. Many are correct, but some aren't. And those ones that aren't come from misunderstanding of scriptures. I was once in a church that had a lot of wrong beliefs. But thankfully, and I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit chose some men who were not afraid to say, hey, we messed up. This stuff we're teaching is wrong. Because it's interesting what happened when that happened. When those kind of things happen in a church, Christians are Christian for a lot of reasons. I notice that some people are Christian because they want to please God. They love him and they want to do what they can to please him. Others become Christian because they're getting something out of it. Oh, I'm a Christian because what I believe is the only thing that's right and everybody else is wrong. That was one of our beliefs. And when a church has a big change of doctrine, whether it's, and especially if it's proved by Scripture, your church is going to split. Those who are out to just please God are going to accept the truth. Those who aren't are going to stay in their old truth and move on. Now, the reason I bring this up is because it has to do with words. It has to do with what we believe the words say. And it's very important that we understand what Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father are saying to us. What about wicked? What is wicked? Wicked is another word, and this one particularly goes with evil. When you dig into Scripture and you look at the words that are translated wicked, um, you find that that particular word is used 350 times. Eight words of the Old Testament, five in the New. So you have what, 13 different words that are translated wicked. So technically, you have 13 variations of the word wicked. But one thing they all have in common, if you choose to study it, is that it's a personality thing. Evil is an action. Wicked is what you are. Jezebel, again. Scripture tells us that she was wicked. Wickedness, if you look into it, means you plan, you work at, you try to do evil things. You know, there's a lot of wicked people in this world, but there's a lot of people that we say are wicked, but they're really not. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. But it's interesting how we believe about this world and how we believe about people comes from these words and what we understand them to believe, or in most likely what we have been told they believe, because we haven't taken the time to study it ourselves. Because when you study it yourself, it's you, your Bible, and the Holy Spirit. We all know that the Holy Spirit is the final say in all religious matters. He's our teacher. He's our boss. He's the one that wins. We all know how we hear from the Holy Spirit, from our hearts, our minds, and our consciences. 
So a wicked person, according to the understanding that I have from these, is a person who deliberately does not do the will of God. Doesn't want to, isn't going to. Kind of like Jezebel. She knew the will of God. She wouldn't do it. She wasn't going to. So there was, she was a wicked person. Now, there's three other words I want to talk about that we need to understand. And the next word is the opposite of evil, in my mind, is good. What do you think of when I say good? What comes to mind? Right? Yeah, all kinds of wonderful things. All good things produce a good result, for lack of a better word. Good is one of the most powerful words there is. Because who is good? God. God, Jesus told us. Let's see if I can remember. Um, Jesus was talking to a young, wealthy man. And the young, wealthy man asked him what he needed to do to have eternal life. He says, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? Good master, he says. And Jesus looks at him and says, why call me good? Only God is good. Now, when we see that word, have you ever looked up what that word means? If you look up what that word means, its translation is of benefit. Only God is of benefit, is what that word actually means. I found that really interesting, how that word just translated as good has such a deeper meaning that only God is of benefit to us. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that true? You know, I have a dictionary at home. It's, uh, it, was, it was written in 1868, I think it was. It's a Webster. And the guy that, or the men and women who wrote that are obviously Christians, because throughout the book, with all the words, they give scriptures where that word is used. And one of the things that I noticed is that good has about that many words after it. Good this, good that, good life, good God, good Father, good house, good everything. And it just goes on and on and on. And I was reading that, realizing that God is of a benefit. Only God is of a benefit. You see good, and in every one of those, you see an aspect of God's personality, of God's belief, of who God is, of how he is, what he thinks, why he does what he does. And I realized that the opposite of good is righteousness. Because good, the, no, the, okay, the opposite, the, Part, they say, what goes with evil is wickedness. So what goes with good is righteousness. Right, got that? Okay. Anyways, if you look at righteousness, God's righteousness, it's his desire to always do good. Isn't he always looking for ways to do things for us? Always. There's never a time when he doesn't. He watches us. He works with us. He teaches us. He helps us make good decisions. He helps us do the right thing. He helps us want to do the right thing. He allows us to see and feel the joy of helping somebody. He does that with us, and he's always looking for it. There's not a second of our lives that he's not. Even with people who don't or haven't accepted Jesus yet, he's doing the same thing. He makes a statement to where all good things come from him. And out of all bad things, something good comes. That's God. That's his goodness. That's his righteousness. And in our heads, he's playing with that little board, pushing it ever closer to his righteousness, ever closer to his goodness, ever farther away from wickedness, and ever farther away from evil. Now, we have to remember that evil and wickedness is a choice. 
It's something a human being chooses to do. We choose to be evil, or we choose to be wicked. Okay? Now let's look at the word sin. Have you ever looked up what the word sin means? I was really kind of flabbergasted because what I always thought of as sin was really quite different. The word sin is used um, about four or 500 times in, in the Bible. Uh, five words in the New Testament and about six words in the Old Testament. But they all have a similar meaning, specifically ones in the New Testament. They all come from the exact same word. They're just different variations of that word. So in the Old Testament, um, the, the words mean to miss, an offense, guiltiness, a fault linked to presentation of a sin offering. In other words, you sinned, now you've got to go offer a bullock or a dove or something. That's what that particular sin meant. But when you come to what God calls sin in the New Covenant, it's a little bit different. It says, unlearned or ignorant, to miss the mark, an offense, a sin. There's no condemnation in it. Have you notice what those words are? I missed the mark. Oops, sorry, Dad. Uh, I didn't know. I'm ignorant. Can you see the difference how the words in the Old Testament, they saw sin as something horrible, and you had to go sacrifice something to get back on God's good side? Sin still sin. But it's not how I look at sin that's important. It's how God looks at sin in this book, and this book tells us how he looks at sin. And we need to understand what these words actually mean. We are the children of the Most High God. Do you realize that? Do you believe it? Do you accept it? Does it bring you joy in your, to your heart to know that? You're going to live forever. You're not part of this world anymore. And we have a member here that's going to take that step today. He's going to move from this world to God's world. We need to understand how our Father thinks. He doesn't think like us. Uh, let's see, did I write it down? I might have. But there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. His thoughts and his ways are higher above our hearts, our thoughts and his ways, as the heavens are above the earth. As his child, I want to think like him. I don't want to think like me anymore. We need to understand that if we don't make an honest effort to get down with the Holy Spirit and find out what the words in Scripture mean, we're going to make mistakes. God is perfect in all his ways. He does not make mistakes. Now, we all understand that the Bible is 100% accurate. When it was given, it was 100% accurate. 99% of it is still accurate. But some of our translations aren't quite up to par. As to remember that the men and women who translated the scriptures, a lot of them, had beliefs that God was not a God of love. Okay? So they're going to translate a lot of stuff because a lot of these words can go either way. And if your image of God is a hard taskmaster God, they're going to translate it that way. But if your image is a loving, kind, gentle God, which is who he is, always has been and it never changed, and you have to see them from that way. So if you can see this word that can be either way, you go, oh, this is not God. It has to be this one. And then what happens is as we grow in grace and knowledge, as the Holy Spirit teaches our heart, we see God for who he is. And again, this brings me back to our Great Commission. How can we possibly preach Jesus if we don't know who he is? 
if we under, don't understand what he thinks, why he does what he does. If I think that all sin is just horrid evil, I'm not going to want to go near people like that. It's scary. You don't know what they're going to do. But when we realize that by understanding what these words say, that most people are not wicked. Most people aren't out there doing evil things to deliberately hurt. Most people are in the New Testament form. They don't know. Uh, it's just, they just did it. How many of us have just done something which is sin? And you go, oh man, I didn't see that coming. It wasn't wickedness. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't evil. We weren't trying to hurt anybody. We weren't trying to disobey God. It just happened. And a lot of sin is that way. I would per se that probably the majority of it is that way. So running and hiding from everybody, we don't have to. We are all strong in our belief structures. We know who Jesus is. We know who the Father is. We know who the Holy Spirit is. We know that we are living on God's faith, not our faith. We know that we can hide behind Jesus anytime we need to. Have you ever seen the little boy peeking out behind Daddy? Well, most of us do that a lot. We're sitting there peeking out from behind Jesus, and he's standing there. Come on, come out here. And as we go, we become stronger. As we go, we become more able to handle the fiery darts of Satan. We can go and talk to somebody, and they don't agree with us, and we don't get upset. We can talk with people about our belief structures. And the thing is, when we are firm in our beliefs, because we have studied the words, we have studied the word of the Most High God diligently, fervently, at the tutelage of the Holy Spirit, we cannot be turned from what's true. As we go about our lives, as we work to become more like Jesus, as we study the scriptures to understand how God thinks, we can say to ourselves, hey, I know how God thinks. I know what he would do in this situation. He would determine what's the most loving thing to do, and that's what he would do. And he wouldn't care about what happened to himself. He proved that when Jesus gave his life for us. The loving thing to do was to live a perfect life and die so that we could all live. So as you guys go about your lives, think about how you study. Think about what you believe. Just because I got up here and said all this stuff doesn't mean it's true. It's only true when you and the Holy Spirit dive into this thing, where you study the words for yourself, where you look at it and be like the Bereans and say, wait, so-and-so said such and such. I wonder if it's true. And you get in there and you prove it or disprove it, whichever the case may be. Do I know everything? Absolutely not. I might know the first three words. Everything else, I'm still learning like everybody else. And we're going to be learning up until the day we're all sitting around that giant campfire with God, and he's personally teaching us again. We all have a lot of stuff that we don't, that is wrong. It just is. We're human. We can't help it. But it's okay. That doesn't affect God in the least. He has all of us, and he will not let go. We can go forth. We can be sure that God is with us. You're going to start a marvelous adventure. You don't even have a clue of what's about to happen to you in the next few months, but it will be wonderful. <laughs>